This video is going to be heavy on the logic and coding. So if that's not for you, suggest you give this PowerFlow video a miss. And we'll be back and have a look at the mechanical and assembly in the next video. Hey, welcome back to Tommy Gun Machining. I'm Tom, and let's have a look at the programming for the mill power feed. Before we get into the scary code, let's talk through the desired outcome, the steps required to get there, and then the actual program required to achieve this goal. This makes up part of my mill power feed project. Essentially, I want to be able to push a button to drive the x-axis of my mill at different speeds. I also want the table stopping automatically at limit switches, but with the option of bouncing between limit switches as an additional benefit. I also want to be able to manually reverse the direction when I want to, and rapidly move at the press of a button. There's also going to be an e-stop button for those panic occasions. PANIC! It's also going to be future-proofed with the ability to interface with, say, an electronic dividing head. And that way I can cut, rotate to the next index mark, take a cut, etc. for gear cutting. But that's a future project. Okay, now for the logic. When we turn the power feed on, we don't want it to start moving instantly. If the power flicks off and then flicks on, a tool might crash into our vise, and that would be bad. So to prevent this, we have an initial hold that requires user input, and from there we go into the main program loop. And there's a few things that we want to check before we actually get motion. So first up, we check, has a limit switch been triggered? Has the user asked everything to change direction? And lastly, we want to check, have we asked it to stop? Important one to have. So what's happening is the program is cycling through these really fast. So have we hit a limit switch? Have we asked it to change direction? And have we asked it to stop? And if all of these are okay, then we drive the stepper. So we get motion. So this is a top level approach of what we're trying to achieve. Let's go a bit more into the logic of it. And this is the way you've got to think when doing code. Have we hit a limit switch? No, continue looping. If we have hit it, we stop. So we stop and we change the direction. Now direction change button. If we haven't pressed it, we continue looping. If we have hit it, we stop and change direction. We're starting to see a pattern here. So we're doing this a lot. We can break this down to a smaller code and make a separate function. So we only have to write this block of code once. Moving on now, if the hold button is not pressed, we continue looping. Slight change now, if it is pressed, we completely stop until the button is repressed. This is the very basic program. I've built in a few extra layers of complexity into this. So let's have a look at those. So I've got some extra controls. I've got toggle buttons, I've got rapid buttons, and speed control. Let's add those into the mix. Going back to our limit switch function, after it has been triggered, everything will stop and everything will try and change direction. However, I've now got toggle buttons built in. So I've got a left and a right toggle button, and these are independent. These toggle buttons are latching buttons, so they can remain on or off. I don't need to hold them down. So when, a, when the limit switch is triggered and the toggle button is pressed in, everything will completely stop, and it will stay there until the direction button is pressed. And in this case, then everything will resume, but heading in the opposite direction. Now, if the limit switch is triggered and the toggle button is off, we go. So this is essentially bounce. So we swap direction and go, or we swap direction and stop until we tell it to go. Now, the drive. This is where we build in our rapids and our speed control. We have this rapid button. So we do a check. If this is pressed, we read the rapid potentiometer speed. And if the rapid is not pressed, running out of space here. I think you can get the idea of the travel potentiometer. So if this is pressed, we read this and turn accordingly. If it's not pressed, we read this and turn the stepper at whatever travel speed we've got. So every single time it loops through this, it checks the speed. And this is the entire flow for my power feed program. And this is looping very fast. If this, this, and this meet the conditions, you drive the stepper and drive it at the speed that you want. So let's briefly look at the code. Let's look at the Arduino code itself in relation to the logic. As scary as all this code looks, and also there's this function tab, it looks like there's a lot there, but when you break it down to individual sections, it's not too bad. 
Like most programs, this starts off establishing variables. It's essentially giving everything a name. That makes it easier for you, the dumb human, to interpret your code. And that way I know whenever I want to read the stop button, I don't have to remember it's on the second pin. And I have to do this with every single pin, and I've got to tell it if it's an input or an output. And the last part of this initial setup is giving everything an initial state. So for example, I've elected an initial travel direction, so the table will start heading towards the right. And now we get on to our hold function. This is just an endless loop until you release the stop button. Then we go into our main loop. So as we said on the paper, we initially check to see if a limit switch has been triggered. We check to see if the direction button has been pressed, and then we check to see if the hold button has been pressed. And for the way I've set this up, within the hold check, I've got the drive function inbuilt into that. Now within each of these functions, I've got more elaborate code, of course. So we'll start going into that. So we'll start off with the initial hold function. And this function is just an endless loop. Now built into the loop, it's got a count function. It counts for so many seconds, and then it will bleep. And this is just to remind you that it's sitting there idle, ready to go. Every single time it's looping through this, I don't know, hundreds of times a second, it's checking to see if you've released the stop button. Alright, now we're on to the limit check. Now there's a lot in this, lots of ifs and ands. It's due to considerations such as the toggle buttons. Let's get into that. So what it does, it checks the state of the left limit switch when the table is travelling in the left direction. So if the limit switch is triggered, it calls up this flip command, which flips the direction travel lights, and it also goes into a direction change function. The next section of code here in the limit switch function is identical, except it's checking for the right button. The direction change function is quite simple. So it checks, have we pressed the direction change button? If we have, it'll flip the indication around and change the table direction. Now you'll see there's a delay in here. Buttons are a mechanical system. When you press a button in, they tend to bounce a bit. You might see a debounce button in programs sometimes. And this is to allow for this. So I press it once and there's a short delay. This means I can't, this also means I can't spam the button, but what it really does is only reads one press. So the table is guaranteed to go in the opposite direction to how it's currently moving. So we've referenced the flip and direction change functions a bit. So let's have a look at those. The flip function deals with the indicator lights. So if you look on my control box, there's a, there's a red and a green light for traveling to left or right. And that way I can tell where the table is gonna go when I hit resume. To flip these lights, I've got a direction variable that's always in the background, and it's either L or R. So when we ask it to flip, it looks at what is the current direction. If the current direction is to the left, L, we change it to the right, R. Then we take the left light, bring that down to a low state, and take the right light up to a high state. And this makes the correct light come on or off. So let's look at the direction change function. When driving a stepper with the Arduino, there's there's a pin that you send out to the stepper driver. This is a direction pin. So this only has two states. It's either high or low. So one of these will correspond to the stepper traveling to the left and the other to the right. So I've just got a variable running in the background, whether this is high or low. When this function is called up, it looks at what the current output is. If it's high, it instead outputs low. And if it's low, it instead outputs high. And the stepper driver will correspondingly change the stepper mode direction. Now, we're up to the hold function, which is our emergency stop, but it's also got our drive inbuilt as well. The stop button is another latching toggle button. So if the stop button is pressed in, the rest of the code will be stopped. It won't ever get down to the drive section of the code. This function will end here, and then we'll go back to the main loop and check the limit switches, the direction button, and then come back to the hold to see if the button is released. As long as that button is pressed in, we can never get motion. So if the button is, so if the stop button is not pressed in, we then call up the run function. And this is where I've got all the drive in built. The Arduino's got a little clock in it. So when this program first starts up, it looks at what's the current time, and they'll be used later on for outputting the correct stepper speed. So after this, it looks at whether or not the rapid button is pressed. So if the rapid button is not pressed, it reads the analog input that comes from the travel speed potentiometer. The value that comes from this is fairly useless to us. It's a value from zero to 255, and that means nothing in terms of driving a step motor. So you can see we've got this map function, and this takes that zero to 255 and converts it into a delay period, which through trial and error, I've come up with what I think is a reasonable travel speed. So this is just a delay. When this function started, we took a snapshot of the time then, 
and now it's just going to wait until our required delay time has passed and then it will output a pulse to the stepper driver. Each time pulse goes to the stepper driver, it will turn the stepper by one micro step. We won't get into micro stepping, that's a whole different science on its own and I'm fairly ignorant of it. By having the delay inbuilt, we're metering out a certain pulse rate to that stepper driver. If you remember, the loop is moving really fast, probably hundreds of times a second. So when it's running, that, that stepper is moving a few hundred steps. Now if the rapid button is pressed, the exact same thing happens, except I've mapped the delay time to a much shorter delay. This means a much faster pulse rate goes to the stepper driver, so we can get faster speeds. Simple as that. And to be honest, that's it. That's the whole program. When you, whenever you program, you've got to break it down into logic steps, and then it gets really straightforward. You just got to think, if this, do that. Otherwise, do this. It's just a different mindset when you're doing it. And that's it in terms of code. Now you don't have to be a programmer to do any of this stuff. I'm certainly not. And if you do want to learn, I'd seriously suggest getting the Arduino. Not sponsored. They're relatively cheap, and you really can't mess them up. Your first few projects will be turning lights on and off. But when you start to think, if you replace that light instead with a motor, you can start getting automation and doing real stuff. Good thing if you want to learn something new. So that's about it for this. We'll address that next video. That's about it for this video. Next video, we'll look at the mechanical side of things and the final assembly. Anyway, have a good Christmas all, and I'll catch you on the next video. Boop!